What is up, Dublin Powell Youth? Happy Sunday. Uh, it's so great to talk to you all again. Last week, we saw Jesus' ministry begin as he was baptized, called his disciples, and met the Samaritan woman at the well. This week, we will explore three major parts of Jesus' ministry that show why we should believe he is no ordinary man. Today is Sunday, September 27th. Let's get into it. There was a man called John the Baptist, who was actually the cousin of Jesus. He would often baptize those who decided to follow God, dunking them in a lake as a symbol of their choice. One day, Jesus came to John and asked him to be baptized. When he did, he saw the sky split open. Then he heard a voice from heaven say, This is my son, whom I love. Then Jesus went out into the wilderness. There, the devil showed up and put Jesus through a series of tests. Jesus refused the temptations, and the devil left. Jesus continued to travel across the area, meeting with everyone, telling them how they could live God's way. Jesus healed people with all kinds of illnesses. He spoke about a new kingdom that was very different from anything people had heard before. Many people were amazed but some of the religious leaders were angry and fearful as his following grew. Almost everywhere Jesus went, huge crowds came to see and hear him. One time, he began teaching by a lake. The crowd became so big that he actually had to speak from a boat out in the water. Jesus often told stories, called parables, about everyday life that were symbolic of who God was and what it meant to live in God's ways. Jesus also performed many miracles everywhere he went. He healed sick people and even raised some from the dead. He could also control the weather. One time, when Jesus and his followers were in a boat on a lake, a huge storm came in and the boat began to fill with water. Despite the storm blowing the boat around, Jesus was asleep. Panicked, his followers woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus stood up and commanded the wind and the waves, Quiet, be still. And the storm was gone. Many people were amazed at the miracles Jesus performed, but the religious leaders, called Pharisees, started to question where Jesus got his power from. At one point, they even accused him of getting power from the devil. King Herod was also fearful of Jesus. A short time earlier, Herod had thrown John the Baptist in jail. He wanted to kill John, but knew that he was a holy man and feared what might happen if he did. Then one day, Herod's daughter was dancing and entertaining Herod's guests at a banquet. Herod was pleased with her and told her she could have anything she requested. Herod's wife stepped in, telling their daughter that she should request the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod was fearful, but what could he do? He had promised to give his daughter what she requested, and so he had John beheaded and the executioners brought his head into the banquet. As Jesus' fame grew, King Herod began to worry that Jesus would bring John back from the dead. Even Jesus' followers began to have second thoughts about him. But his 12 closest followers stuck by Jesus for what was sure to be tough times ahead. So this week we're looking at three major parts of Jesus' ministry on earth. His parables, the Sermon on the Mount, and his miracles, and how each of them played a part in his overall message. First up is the parables. I think we all know that Jesus liked to use illustrations to reveal the, the unfathomable goodness 
of of God's kingdom uh, to people on earth who couldn't really totally grasp it. So we use parables to kind of bridge our understanding with with God's reality. Uh, for example, he directly describes the kingdom of God like a mustard seed, the smallest seed that the people were aware of at the time, which grows into the biggest of any garden plants, with branches so big that birds can land on them. You see, the message of Jesus is really quite simple, quite basic, but like the mustard seed, it has enormous implications and consequences uh, in our lives. Uh, it changes everything. One of the teachers of the law asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life, and Jesus turns the question back to him. And the man answers with what we all know as the greatest commandment, which this teacher of the law knew from Deuteronomy 6. You see, it, he says in Luke 10, starting in verse 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. So Jesus tells him that this is correct, that this is in fact the simple message he has brought to his people. But the teacher of the law wants to complicate things. He wants to add qualifications to this commandment, asking Jesus, but who is my neighbor? To, to whom do I owe this abundant love? And Jesus breaks it down for him, telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'll read that verbatim uh, from Luke 10, starting in verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothing, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, we talk occasionally about who the Samaritans are, but I don't think we always really drive it home. You see, the Samaritans, depending on if you believe their version of their history or the Jewish version of their history, were either Israelites who escaped the destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria, or they were Assyrian colonists sent to take over the area around Samaria and Shechem after the Jews were taken away. Now, if you're anything like me, when you heard the stories of the Samaritans, it might have sounded like Samaria was another nearby kingdom, like Syria or Aramea. But in fact, Samaria was just a city in the northern kingdom. It was right between Jerusalem and the Sea of Galilee. So if they could be Israelites, why did the Jews hate them so much? The Samaritans often profess to worship the same God as the Jews, but the intertestamental literature and the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus suggest that they supported the Greek invasion of Israel and even changed their temple to be named after Greek gods. Oh, and also did I mention they had their own temple? They worshipped on Mount Gerizim, far from Jerusalem and Mount Zion, and far from the site of the second temple. Basically, they, they shared some identity with the Israelites, but they changed it in key ways, just enough to make it feel like, well, a complete betrayal. The highest of heresies to worship and offer sacrifices across the kingdom from Mount Zion? Unbelievable. On top of that, many Jews saw them as foreign occupiers who had stolen the land and the name of Yahweh for evil purposes. Which leads me to this. Why did Jesus focus so much on the Samaritans? I mean, last week we read about how he intentionally diverted through Samaria to show grace to the Samaritan woman at the well. 
And this week, he makes the Samaritan the hero of his story and tells the teacher of the law, go and do likewise, showing even mercy and love to Samaritans. The simple answer is because Jesus didn't come to tell the Jews how great they were for staying separate from the kingdoms of the world and upholding God's law and to give them their bountiful reward. In fact, as we've seen throughout the story so far, the Jews often did the exact opposite of fulfilling their purpose in this world. Instead, Jesus came to tell the Jews that it was finally time for them to really fulfill their purpose and to go and tell the world, including the Samaritans, that the kingdom of God had come for all of them. This got me thinking about the Samaritans of our day, of people who American Christianity as a whole or, or in parts has treated as a Samaritan. I think of the LGBTQ community, of undocumented immigrants, of our black brothers and sisters who are still to this day tearfully asserting that their lives matter, and of the denominations, the ones that we fear miss the heart of the gospel. I strongly believe that Jesus told the teacher of the law in Luke 10 that with all of those people he was to first show them love, and that he would have us tell them that the kingdom of God is here for them, that Jesus loves them and died to make their brokenness whole. Who have you been treating in your heart like a Samaritan? How can you instead show them love as a neighbor? Also in this chapter, Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, where the people come to him, and on a mountainside, he speaks more directly than he had in his parables. The Sermon on the Mount is where we get the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, and all the rest. It's also in this sermon that Jesus shares the Lord's Prayer, teaching the people to pray, giving praise to God, asking for just enough to get through the day, and asking for forgiveness, grace, and deliverance from sin. Jesus also instructs them in Matthew 6, starting in verse 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And he wraps up his sermon with a warning, that anyone who follows his words will be like a wise person who builds their house on a strong foundation and that it will withstand wind and rain and storm. But for those who hear him and do not act are like ones who build their house on sand. And when the storms come, it falls down. And finally, Jesus starts to perform many miracles. He heals people everywhere he goes. And he feeds the crowds that follow him into the wilderness. One example is when the crowd had followed Jesus into the wilderness, and the disciples said he should send them all away so they could get food. But Jesus is like, why not just feed them here so we can keep talking? And the disciples are like, well, Jesus, there are 5,000 of them, and we have five loaves of bread and two fish. I, how is that going to work? But Jesus tells them to sit all the people down, and he gives thanks for the loaves and, and the fish and tells his disciples to start handing them out. And everyone was fed. In fact, they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers after everyone had eaten. Another time, a woman who had been sick for a long time, who had been taken advantage of by every physician and healer who all failed to make her well, but gladly took her money. She heard that Jesus was coming, and she knew that if she could just touch his robe, she would be healed. So she tries to touch it quickly and sneak away, but Jesus, of course, noticed that, hey, I just healed someone. Like, I felt that. And he calls for her to stop, and he tells her in Mark 5.34, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And 
everywhere Jesus goes, people are coming to him to be healed and to be freed from demons. What's interesting about the miracles is that so many people today in in different faith traditions will look at them and say, wow, look how great God is. He wants us all to be healthy and have lots of fish and bread to eat. And, well, sure, God wants what's best for us in in his divine plan, but focusing on Jesus' ministry as a ministry of bodily health completely missed the most amazing part of why he came. I believe that the miracles Jesus performed, while they were great, primarily served to prove he was who he said he was, so that when he promised us something far greater than sight or the ability to walk or or some fish to eat in the desert, we would have faith in that promise. And we'll talk more about that promise next week. Let me pray for us before we go. Our Father in heaven, we, we give you glory and praise because you are our God and you are worthy of praise. We thank you this week for the message of Jesus' ministry, that you have established your kingdom through him and by your grace and mercy, we're all able to take part in it. We pray this week that you would open our hearts to all of our neighbors, that we would show them love abundantly and would faithfully share the good news of the kingdom of God with them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for studying with me again this week, y'all. Talk to you next time. Grace and peace. I see the world in grace. I see the world in gospel. I see the world in grace.